Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the first talk of the second main track today. Uh, today we are Furkan talking about reusability in core boot and a bit of a tale about it. So please give a big round of applause and enjoy. Thank you. Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Furkan Sheikh, and uh, I'm here to narrate a tale of reusability in code boot. A little about myself. I work for Google in the Chrome OS firmware team. I actually started out in this team as an intern, and I have been working on code boot and Chrome OS for the past five years now. So this is a quick overview of the topics that I plan to cover today. Please feel free to ask me questions at any point. Okay, so I, th I believe some of you here are familiar with what Chrome OS is. But for those who are not, I would define it as a single collection of mostly open source software running on a variety of hardware. We have shipped Chromebooks with Intel x86, ARM32, ARM64 SOCs, including the ones from NVIDIA, MediaTek, and Rockship. So all the Chromebooks, except a few early ones, use Core Boot as their machine initialization routine. And rest of the software stack includes libraries like Verified Boot Library, third-party firmware like ARM Trusted Firmware, some blobs, FSP, Depth Charge, which is the OS loader, and finally, the Linux kernel. Chromebooks have actually gained a lot of popularity in the EDU segment in US. And with devices like Google Pixelbook, HP Chromebook X2, the focus is expanding towards consumer segment as well. So the combination of software and hardware that we saw is actually just one of the components that goes into building an entire Chrome OS platform. And it is referred to as the application processor. Apart from the application processor, there are a number of different controllers, like the embedded controller, TCPC, PMEC, and a variety of peripherals like keyboard, touchscreen, trackpad, and more. This might actually look familiar to some of you, since it is similar to any typical computing platform. The model that Chrome OS follows for all of its platforms looks something like this. So the Chrome OS team at Google designs a reference platform using the components that we saw before. Then one of the OEMs is chosen as the lead OEM, and they copy the reference platform as is and ship a device with it. Next, multiple OEMs come on board, and they add their own tweaks on top of the reference platform and ship multiple follower devices. Now, even though there is a single block shown for each OEM device, there could be multiple SKUs here, like convertible versus clamshell SKU, touchscreen versus non-touchscreen, different memory SKUs, or different storage SKUs. One example of this model is GLaDOS. So the reference platform GLaDOS was designed using Intel Skylake SoC. The lead OEM shipped Shell using GLaDOS, and different OEMs shipped devices like Caroline and Cave. A better example of this model is actually Reef. The reference platform Reef was designed using Intel Apollo Lake SoC. The lead OEM shipped Reef as is, and various OEMs later shipped on follower devices like Nasher, Pyro, San, and Snappy. Another example of this model is Coral. But Coral was special in a number of ways. One of the unique things about Coral was that, since it was a refresh device based on Intel Apollo Lake SoC, it derived from the same reference platform, Reef. And Coral itself was never shipped, but instead, Multiple follower OEM devices were shipped like Astronaut, Robo, Nasher, etc. The other unique thing about Coral is that all the OEM devices shipped with a single unified firmware image. That is, a single o uh, firmware image was used on all the OEM devices from this family. Now, this approach had its own advantages and disadvantages, and we'll take a look at that later. Finally, the most recent platform is Octopus. Here we have two reference platforms, YORP and BIP, which allows the OEMs to have a wider selection of components and multiple OEM devices like Phaser, Me, Fleeks, and Boba. Uh, 
But you must be wondering that this story was supposed to be about Codeboot. And all I have been doing is talking to you about Chrome OS. Actually, it is important to know the background here in order to understand the decisions that were taken within Codeboot. So let's rewind back and first take a look at the objectives that we are trying to achieve. The first objective is faster time to market. So OEMs would like to ship devices as soon as possible. They would like to have more flexibility with respect to component selection. Obviously, we would like to avoid duplication of work within the software stack. This kind of ties in with our first example of being able to ship devices as soon as possible. So anytime a new device has to be added to the same family, you'd want to make use of the existing infrastructure. Next is making the whole process manageable for everyone. This includes the electrical engineers who are designing the hardware, software engineers who are designing the firmware and the OS, for the OEMs and ODMs to actually ship devices, and even for the test team to be able to validate these devices. And finally, making the whole process scalable so that we you're able to ship more and more devices each and every year. So let's see how these objectives are being achieved using the same uh, platforms that we saw before. The first example was GLaDOS. On the left is the hardware view of the platform, and on the right is the software or firmware view. By firmware, I basically mean the BIOS, or more specifically, Core Boot in this case. Here, each OEM device got its own firmware. Now, as you see on the hardware side, there is a clear hierarchy or like reusability since all the different devices are based on the same reference platform, GLaDOS. But on the firmware side, apart from the common block one, which is the Arch SOC library code, there was no sharing at the main board level, even though they were all derived from the same reference platform. One of the files that was very commonly duplicated across different boards was the mainboard.asl file. Mainboard.asl basically allowed you to uh, like describe different devices that are present on a platform, like touchscreen device, trackpad device, TPM device. So here's an example of mainboard.asl file from GLaDOS, Shell, and Caroline, respectively. It specifically highlights the touchscreen device node. So if you observe closely, the entire device node, or most of the device node looks similar across the different boards. And there are just a very few differences, like the head, which is actually used by the kernel driver to identify the device, the device descriptor, the I2C address for the device, and the touchscreen IRQ, basically the ones highlighted in red. And this duplication was present not just for the touchscreen node, but for all the other devices as well. And it's not restrict it was not restricted to GLaDOS. We had a number of boards which did the same thing. In order to fix this duplication, SSDT generation was added to Codeboot. So SSDT generation basically allows runtime addition of device nodes to ACPI SSDT based on the device tree properties. It basically relieves the developers from hectic task of having to define all these device nodes in ACPI source language. ASL is not that difficult to learn, but for a newcomer, it could take some time. So the underlying idea here is that a driver in RAM stage would be responsible for generation of these nodes at runtime. You can find some examples under I2C generic, SPI ACPI, or generic GPIO keys. But these generators are not limited to just drivers. You can also use them for like CPU node generation, PCI device generation, and more. A good way to locate these generators is by doing a grep for ACPI fill SSDT generator in Core Boot sources. It is basically the callback that is used for the table generation. Now, using this SSDT generation, the same touchscreen device node can be described using the block on the right, where you just have to indicate what driver is to be used, in this case, the driver's I2C generic, and the same properties that were different among different devices, like the head, descriptor, the IRQ, and the I2C. This SSDT generation has since been used on all the older as well as new platforms that are being added to Codeboot. Next example is the Reef platform. Again, on the left is the hardware view, and on the right is the firmware view. 
Similar to GLaDOS, each device in the Reef family got its own firmware. So similar to GLaDOS, we have a common block one, which is the Arch SOC library code. But apart from that, there is a common block two across all these different devices, and a block three, which is different among these devices. The reason why we see a common block two on Reef is because it introduced the concept of baseboard and variant structures. So unlike GLaDOS, which basically added a new directory under mainboard for each device from the GLaDOS family, Reef followed a completely different hierarchy. The underlying idea here is that the different devices that belong to the same family require similar initialization and device logic. So all of this common code can be placed under a baseboard directory. And only the things that differ across these different devices can go under variant specific directories. So we have a single directory reef under mainboard Google. And under variants, we have a baseboard, which would be most of the common code, and then different directories for the different variants. This actually takes us a step closer to a data-driven approach, where common code is doing all the work for you, and the variant-specific variant specific code or data is providing just the information that is required by the common code to do its work. So because of this, we, uh, the common block two that we saw earlier was the baseboard specific code that is common across all the different devices in this family. And the block three is the variant specific code and data. Uh, let's see how much code had to be added to support each new variant in Reef. So as expected, majority of the code went into mainboard Google Reef and the baseboard directory. If you look at the variants, Reef and Nasher were pretty lightweight. They almost had no new code in them. It basically consists of some header files, and those header files essentially just pointed back to the baseboard directory. But if you look at SAN, Pyro, and Snappy, they still look pretty bulky. And one of the reasons is the device tree.cb file. It's the one that is highlighted in red. It kind of occupies more than 50% of the lines that are added. I understand that lines of code might not be a very good metric here, but it's just being used as a reference for comparison. So apart from the device, so, OK, let's keep the device. I understand that the device tree had a lot of duplication in it, and there was a lot of scope for optimization. But we'll get back to that later. So apart from the device tree file, the differences that we see are in dptf.asl, which is basically the thermal table. And this has to be different based on the different device, devices. The other differences are mainly in like memory.c or GPIO configuration. So the differences that we are seeing here were the actual differences that were present in hardware. And so they required some amount of firmware code. So if we ignore the device tree for a while, overall, the variant and baseboard structure actually allowed us to save a lot of duplicate code within core boot. The baseboard and variant structure has since been used for all the new platforms that are being added. And uh, also some of the older platforms have been migrated to this uh, structure. Our next platform is Coral. As I mentioned before, Coral was special in a number of ways. And one of the unique things about Coral was that it shipped using a single unified firmware image. That is, all the devices had the same firmware image. So what we see here is the devices from this family have common block 1, 2, and 3. So there's no difference among them. This approach obviously had its own positives and negatives. Positives because it reduced the amount of work that was required on the firmware development front. Obviously, we could use OEM IDs and SKU IDs to distinguish between these devices at runtime. But it also had its own disadvantages. Disadvantages for the OEMs because it restricted them to the number of components or the components that they could actually use on their own device, and to the test team. Because any time a new firmware had to be released for any one device, it had to be validated on the entire pool of devices. This is actually a very good example which shows us that reusability might not always be beneficial, or it might actually not help us achieve the objectives that we saw earlier. So we need to find a fine line between achieving the objective of reusability and reducing the effort or achieving the other uh, objectives. 
So based on our learnings from other platforms, here is the most recent platform, Octopus. Octopus moved back to using uh, a different firmware image for each OEM device. So you see that there's a common block one, two, but block three is different among these devices. Here we have two reference platforms, YORP and BIP, which allows the OEMs to have a wider selection of components. They can do a mix and match of different components from the reference platform. It also uses all the features that we saw earlier, like SSDT generation and uh, the baseboard and variant structure. If you notice carefully, the block two on Octopus is slightly bigger or larger than the block that we saw on Reef. And one of the reasons for this is the same problem that we identified earlier regarding device tree duplication. So let's go back to the uh, Reef example and look at what the problem with device trees was. So these are the same three variants, SAN, Pyro, and Snappy. And uh, on, the right, on the left, you can see that even though the files were like more than 200 lines, the actual differences between these device trees was less than 35% or even less than 10% in some cases. So in case of SAN, even though the file was like 230 lines, the actual difference was just 16 lines. In order to fix this issue of duplication, sconfig utility, which is used to basically generate the static.c file from device trees, was updated to allow variants to specify an override tree. What this does is, it basically applies the variant-specific overrides on top of the properties that are already provided by the base device tree. Obviously, there are certain rules that need to be used for overriding. So if a property is present in both the base tree and the override tree, then the one from the override tree gets precedence. If it is present in only one tree, then that's the one that's used. If a device is present in the override tree, then it gets added to the appropriate parent in the base tree. If the base parent already had some children, then this new device gets added as a sibling of those children. Enabling of this override device tree is as simple as basically just setting the override device tree config to point to the variant tree and setting the required properties and device info which is specific to this variant in that tree. The sconfig utility will basically walk through the base tree and the override tree in lockstep fashion, applying the properties and device nodes as appropriate. A good example of how device trees can be used uh, can be found under Octopus. So that is the reason why we basically have a bigger common block too, where we are able to use more common code across these different variants from the same family. So to summarize, we started with GLaDOS, where we did not have any sharing at the main board level between different variants, even though uh, there was a clearly reuse at the hardware level. Then we moved on to Reef, where we added the concept of baseboard and variant structures, thus introducing the common block too. On Coral, we went uh, with complete reusability using the same firmware on all the different variants, but we learned that having a lot of reusability might not actually be beneficial. And finally, the recent platform, Octopus, where we were able to use uh, override device trees to have more, uh, more sharing across the different variants. So what's next? Um, I'd like to highlight one of the challenges that we currently have, which is GPIO config table duplication. So similar to device trees, here the baseboard basically provides one set of GPIO configurations. The variant has two options. Either it can go with the one that is provided by the baseboard, or it can define its own configuration. If the variant basically shares the same GPIO routing as the baseboard, then it is okay to just use the one provided by the baseboard. But if there is even one GPIO that is different for the, uh, for the variant, then we have to make an entire copy of the baseboard GPIO config, change that one entry, and add it to the variants directory. Or we might be able to do the variant configuration after the baseboard configuration is done, 
to let the variant uh, configuration stay. But none of these solutions seem optimal. In order to work around this issue, GPIO configure pads with override was added to CodeBoot. It basically allows the baseboard to provide its own GPIO config table, and the variant provides an override table with only those GPIOs that differ from the baseboard. And GPIO configure pads with override basically loops through all the GPIOs that are present in the base table, and it checks if there's an override present for that GPIO. If it finds an override, then the override configuration is used. If it doesn't find an override, it just falls back to the one from the base table. This solution seems OK, but it might not be optimal. The reason why I say this is because GPIO configuration, when you're comparing the different variants, it requires some amount of human effort to identify the differences between the baseboard and the variant GPIOs. And considering the fact that there might be hundreds of GPIOs that are configured per board, there is a lot of probability for human error, especially as the number of variants go on increasing it might become really difficult to track the differences. So, I mean, like I said, this is one of the unresolved challenges. So, uh, and the solution for this problem might actually go beyond code boot as well. Like we saw that uh, reusability might not always be the best solution. We also need to think about the human effort or how easy it is for managing the whole process. So we, I mean, there might be a solution where if we have an automated tool, which can look through the different schematics and identify the GPIOs for that board and compare it with the different variants, it might be able to minimize the effort or human effort that is required. Uh, we can even go a step ahead and actually generate code using these differences so that code boot or human actually doesn't have to do anything and just those tables generated by the tool can be integrated into code boot. So I'd like to leave you with this thought and open it up for questions. Sorry? Um, yeah, hi. Um, with understanding your last model, which, which was this octopus, uh -huh. and I fully agree on it's not always optimal um, to have a common firmware, uh -huh. I want to uh, highlight that the difference here seems to be very small, which is then only the variant specific code, mm -hmm. which remind me of whatever you then change in the, in the one and in the two means the baseboard code, you still have to go through all validation and testing, uh, which I think... Sorry, I didn't get you. Your concern was um, that you, on the previous version where mm -hmm. you had the, f the firmware for all the same. You need to test it then on all boards, right? Okay. So here, you're not in the need of doing that, but only if you change something in the variant specific mm -hmm. code, right? Correct. But if you change it in the baseboard code, then you have to go through the testing anyhow, right? That is because you affect them all. Or Correct. That has always been true. Like if there is something which affects all the boards, like if, you're, if you have to make a change which is going into the baseboard or any kind of common directory, then it is going to affect all the boards. But, I mean, consider this case where device A has certain bug and we had to fix something with, specifically for that device. Mm -hmm. That won't affect any other device. But in case of a single unified firmware image, even that change or unrelated changes for a particular device would also affect all the other devices from that same family. Understood, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. More questions? And just a comment. I was never thinking finding another company even going further with all these nicknames than, than my, <laughs> my, my, my. <laughs> so can you uh, put numbers on how many different vendors and variants and products uh, your team supports in a year? Just to kind of give us a, a better idea of the scale of how this reusability helps ship Chromebooks. So if you consider, so is this like per platform that you're considering? Mm, both. <laughs> so, 
for every single platform, we might have anywhere between like four to seven OEMs, and there could be like at least three to four platforms shipping every year. So at least in development every year. So four into And then you multiple SOCs this way. Well. Yeah, multiple SOCs, multiple OEMs, multiple ODMs. So all of that just keeps on multiplying. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's it. So thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>